good morning. I'm Mickey Levy of the Shadow Open Market Committee, and um, uh, we would like to welcome you to this um, 45th year anniversary meeting of the Shadow Open Market Committee. And want to um, underline that the, the SOMC is sponsored by the Manhattan Institute. And as most of you know, the SOMC is an independent committee of academic and policy economists that analyzes the Federal Reserve and other central banks' monetary and regulatory, financial regulatory policies. And we provide recommendations that are aimed at improving and enhancing policy making and economic performance. Um, in addition to the SOMC's website, which is uh, www.shadowfed.org, uh, which posts uh, uh, and archives the position papers of the SOMC members and videos of the SOMC meetings, uh, the SOMC members are frequent contributors to the Manhattan Institute's E21 website, and we really appreciate the support of MI. Um, well, the, the um, SOMC has come a long way since its founding in 1973 when the early and original goal was to convince the Fed, the economics establishment, and the media that inflation was actually a monetary phenomenon and that the Fed should pursue sound monetary policy with the goal of price stability as the best foundation uh, for sustained healthy economic growth. Uh, fast forward, and the, and the shadow continues to recommend sound monetary policy with an emphasis on the benefits of rules-based uh, guidelines uh, rather than discretionary approach to policy making, and also the important role of sound financial regulatory policies, and, and all these are, are critical to contain sustained healthy economic performance. So before we begin with the first panel, um, and, and you know, which includes, uh, uh, you know, talks by um, Peter and and Michael, um, and then and then our lunch with um, uh, Robert Kaplan, who's president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. I have two announcements to make. The first one is the very very talented uh, Diana Furchgott Roth, uh, formerly director of, of E21, and 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 the Manhattan Institute's. You know, uh, overseer and, and help her out or to the shadow um, has left to become Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Economic uh, Policy, and she's presently Acting Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy um, until her boss is confirmed. And um, she's, you know, the, the shadow wishes her uh, the best of luck, and we've sincerely appreciated all the help she's provided to us. The, the second announcement is our friend and esteemed uh, colleague, Charlie Plosser, uh, who was a member of the Shadow Open Market Committee um, from the early 1990s until he left in 2006 to become president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, a position he held until 2015, has rejoined the Shadow Committee. Um, and so, uh, Charlie, the, the um, the, the SOMC is thrilled to have you back and, and very anxious to work with you, so welcome. And so now um, I'd like to um, you know, start the, the first panel, and, and, and the first panel is entitled Revisiting the Fed's Monetary Policy Framework. And I would just like to consider the context for this, this panel. The economy is in its 10th um, consecutive year of economic expansion, and performance is strong with real GDP growing significantly faster than the Fed's estimate of potential growth. Labor markets are robust, with the unemployment rate well below the Fed's estimates of the natural rate of unemployment, so-called full employment. Um, inflation has risen above the Fed's 2% target for six consecutive, has been above it for six consecutive months now, if you look at the headline PCE. And while the core PCE, in, core PCE index has been exactly 2% for four months, so thus you could say the Fed has achieved its, its um, dual mandate um, as, you know, legislated by the, the um, 
Full Employment Act in 1977, um, nominal GDP growth has accelerated to 5.4%, which if sustained, this, this pace is, is inconsistent with the Fed's long run objectives. The Fed forecasts that real growth will slow significantly in 2019 to 2.5%, still above the Fed's estimate of, of long-run potential, and then it'll slow further in the years 2020 and 2021, and it forecasts uh, inflation to nudge up to 2.1%, but then remain anchored at its 2% target. All this sounds great, um, but the Fed's track record has been notably poor and unreliable since the financial crisis uh, for the six years from 2010 to 2016, every year the, the Fed over, uh, overestimated real GDP growth. And in 2017 and 18, they've significantly underestimated growth. Um, meanwhile, you know, the, the, the shift, uh, the shift to, uh, toward deregulation and, and tax reform um, is clearly picking up growth, um, while other non-monetary factors like President Trump's tariffs and threats certainly, you know, they add uncertainty to the mix. Um, and whatever seems to happen to the economy and whatever the Fed does, um, I note that the Fed uh, continues to uh, anchor its forecasts and expectations to inflation staying at, at 2%. So, you know, in this context, Fed Chair Powell and uh, Vice Chair Quarles uh, acknowledge the Fed's, the Fed's underwhelming forecasting track record and the sizable uncertainties in estimating longer run potential growth and the natural rate of interest, so-called R star. Um, yet through all this, and all these uncertainties and, and unreliable forecasting, the Fed's um, monetary policy framework is to pursue its dual mandate, relying on discretionary monetary policy rather than any rules-based guidelines. And um, recently, um, in light of having, you know, raising its funds rate target uh, to two to two and, and a quarter, which is effectively zero in real terms, um, the Fed, you know, really is underlining the uncertainties in forecasting the natural rate of interest, and the Fed is, is, is seemingly in the process of tweaking its, its, its forward guidance, um, suggesting that um, maybe it feels like it's getting closer to something that it doesn't know how to forecast, and um, perhaps a more symmetrical approach. But, but with all that, um, with this, you know, all this in mind, I'd like to introduce our, our first speaker, um, uh, Peter, and um, he's going to fill us in. And then after each speaker, we'll take like one or two questions and then open it up for a broader discussion afterwards. All right. Terrific. Thanks, Mickey. <clears throat> so at his uh, speech at the Jackson Hole Symposium this past summer, and then again in a number of other public statements since. Fed Reserve Chair Jerome Powell has delivered an upbeat assessment of the American economy and against that favorable backdrop, outlined the case for his preferred monetary policy strategy, which calls for additional but gradual interest rate increases. In the paper that I prepared for today's session, I look at these same issues recent U.S. economic performance, intermediate term policy strategy, but from a monetarist perspective. The perspective is what I call a monetarist one for two reasons. First and most obviously because the economic analysis focuses on the recent behavior of nominal GDP growth, which is linked via the equation of exchange to underlying trends in the money stock. But the approach is a monetarist one second and maybe even more importantly because it takes very seriously the problem that Chair Powell referred to at Jackson Hole is that of the shifting stars, the variable but uh, uncertain natural rates of interest and in unemployment that are making the Fed's job particularly challenging at present. 
So just to summarize the conclusions before taking you into the details, our monetarist cross-check is in general going to be supportive of Chair Powell, not just in his positive outlook for the economy, but also in his call for additional but gradual interest rate increases. On the other hand, a monetarist view of the shifting stars does suggest some additional conclusions about intermediate term strategy, and those I'll get to at the very end. But focusing first on the economy, recent behavior of nominal GDP growth has been quite striking and actually quite informative, not just about the renewed strength of the American economy, but also about the role Fed Reserve strategy or policy is playing in supporting that renewed strength. Just to put this in perspective, if you go back to the years before the financial crisis from 1990 through 2007, during that period, the average annual rate of nominal GDP growth in the United States was 5.3%. Now, taking out the worst years of the financial crisis and the Great Recession, and just focusing on the period from 2010 through 2016 of stubbornly slow recovery and sluggish inflation, during that interval, nominal GDP growth was 1.5 percentage points lower at 3.8% per year. So if you, like me, think of inflation as being always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, and if by extension you think the Federal Reserve's main role in the economy is to conduct policy so as to pin down over periods like, say, seven years, the average growth rate of nominal variables, it's hard to look at that number, 3.8 versus 5.3, and not conclude that despite everything, Fed Reserve policy was probably insufficiently accommodative during that period of stubbornly slow economic recovery. On the other hand, the behavior of nominal GDP growth has been even more striking recently. Nominal GDP growth has accelerated markedly over the course of the last 18 months, and as a matter of fact, for the past four quarters for which data are available, ending in 2018 quarter two, nominal GDP growth came in at 5.4%. So almost exactly equal to, actually ever so slightly greater than, what we used to think of is the normal average rate before the financial crisis. So looking at that number, 5.4% nominal, nominal GDP growth, it's hard to avoid another conclusion, and that's the conclusion that says Chair Powell is probably right. Finally, after 10 years, the U.S. economy is back to normal. And with the U.S. economy back to normal, it stands to reason Fed Reserve interest rate policy has to get back to normal as well. Given how low interest rates have been for so long, they have to rise further, not to choke off the recovery, but just to bring rates back to where they should be, given macroeconomic fundamentals. Now, like I mentioned at the outset, one of the advantages to looking at the behavior of the economy with a focus on nominal GDP growth is that it sort of invites you to dig a little bit deeper and also look at underlying trends in the money stock. And there, too, there's some uh, interesting and useful information to be gleaned. Regardless of which measure of money you like to focus on, M1, M2, or MZM, all of those measures of broad money growth have decelerated noticeably over the period since 2015, while the Fed's been raising its target for the federal funds rate. So that, too, supports Chair Powell, particularly in his call for a gradual approach to further interest rate increases, again, for exactly the reasons that he's been mentioning lately. The lags are long and variable. There already is significant policy tightening in the pipeline, so you don't want to move too far too fast and risk choking off the recovery. Instead, you just want to proceed step by step to bring interest rates back to where they should be again, given the current state of the economy. So as promised, so far all of the analysis seems to confirm Chair Powell, again, not just in his positive outlook for the economy, but also in his call for additional but gradual interest rate increases. But before I quit, let me just say a few words about the shifting stars, because from a monetarist viewpoint, this was probably the most fascinating aspect 
of Chair Powell's speech at Jackson Hall. And the reason is this sort of, what I would call it is admirable Socratic ignorance that the chair displayed at Jackson Hole, where he say, look it, we just don't know for sure what the natural rates are. We're worried about instability in the Phillips curve. We know the lags are long and variable. So we're not gonna try too hard to fine tune the economy. Instead, we're just gonna proceed gradually to bring interest rates back to where they should be, given the behavior of inflation and unemployment. That's exactly the sort of sentiment that underlies traditional monetarist arguments made by people like Milton Friedman and Alan Meltzer as to why the Federal Reserve should be following a specific monetary policy rule. Milton Friedman, for instance, never claimed that his constant money growth rate rule would work to perfectly fine tune or stabilize the economy. Instead, his arguments, they were exactly the same as Powell's. We don't know the natural rates. The Phillips curve is not a stable structural relationship. The lags are long and variable and forecasting is really hard. For all of those reasons, according to Friedman, an attempt to fine tune the economy through activist discretionary policy was bound to lead to mistakes. The best the Fed could do was to try and avoid the worst mistakes. And in Friedman's view, that could be accomplished by following a rule, just keeping the money stock growing on a constant path. Alan Meltzer's money growth rule was a little more elaborate and ambitious than Friedman's. His allowed the rate of money growth to change over time gradually in response to changes in underlying macro fundamentals. But his arguments to support a rule were, again, exactly the same. We just don't have the knowledge to run a successful discretionary policy. So the key is avoid the worst mistakes of all by following a rule. And then finally, I'll mention that in his very detailed historical study of what went wrong with monetary policy during the high inflation years of the 1970s, Athanasios Orphanides specifically proposed and tested monetary policy rules that were designed to cope with exactly the problems that Chair Powell cited at Jackson Hole, namely variable and uncertain natural rates. So my point is this. The Fed should be following a rule not in spite of all these elements of uncertainty, uncertain natural rates, uncertain Phillips curve instability and the Phillips curve long and variable lags, but precisely because of those elements of uncertainty. So right now, the US economy is doing very, very well. And right now, it looks like monetary policy, Federal Reserve policy, is on track. But risks lurk not too far in the background. And the risks are not just economic, but political as well. We've all seen over the course of the past couple months how quickly and violently political winds can shift against any individual or institution. Against that backdrop, the Fed needs to protect itself against making a major policy mistake that would choke off the economic expansion and maybe even threaten the institution's independence. And the best way of doing that is to announce and stick to a specific policy rule. Thanks. Any quick question? Yes, sir. So, so what is our start? If you're going to follow the Taylor rule, you have to have an inflation target, and you have to think you know what our start is, which varies probably over time. That's right. <laughs> No, that's a good question, but let me just, again, give a monetarist perspective on, on the answer to that question as well. I mean, for decades, we've known that the Achilles heel, heel of monetarism is the variability of velocity, the variability of the velocity of money. And it was that variability in velocity that led the Fed to shift away from an emphasis on money growth towards a more explicit funds rate targeting procedure at some point in the mid to late 1980s. Now we've seen natural rates are volatile as well. So there's no bulletproof solution or foolproof solution to be found. So one thing that I would say is, I mean, this just underscores there's uncertainty and it's useful to look at the economy from different perspectives, including through the lens of money and nominal GDP growth. But then now let me focus specifically on 
on your question. Um, yes, the natural rate of interest is uncertain and variable. I think that a consensus right now is that the natural rate is probably somewhere below the 2% figure that Taylor used when he came up with his original rule in 1993. The consensus seems to be something like 1%. So 1% sounds like a, as good an estimate to me as any. That's where, I mean, if your question was where would you put it, that's where I would put it. Um, I think that, for example, so Jim Bullard has suggested recently with a version of the Taylor rule that um, natural rate may be quite a bit lower still, even still at zero. But I would say look at the run up in the 10 year bond rate that we've seen over the past few weeks. Again, I see that as symptomatic, not of an inflation scare or um, just instability in the financial system. I see that as confirmation that finally the US economy is getting back to normal and estimates of the natural rate need to be shaded up as a result. So I'd still be confident in something like 1%. So that would mean a long run target for the funds rate of 3%. So that would still mean, again, I don't think, I think Federal Reserve policy is pretty much on track right now. I'm not one of these people who um, would be hysterical about falling behind the curve. But I do think additional gradual interest rate increases are called for, and underlying that would be an estimate of about one for, the, for our star. Okay. Uh, as the moderator, I'll take the prerogative to ask you, a, make, a, make a comment. One point you made, I disagree with, and that is you said um, the fact that nominal GDP growth, you know, averaged 3.8, the fact that it was below its prior long run trend suggests monetary policy was too easy. Um, my read of it was, you know, QE2, Operation Twist, QE3, forward guidance. Um, didn't work, and it's because there were non-monetary constraints on on growth, um, like the, you know, the, the tax policy, the growing web of, of regulations, and um, that suggests that monetary policy wasn't too easy. And we noted that Chairman Powell, um, at his um, first um, uh, semi-annual report to Congress in February, said, "Gee, it looks like the." economic headwinds are now tailwinds. And so I'll ask you a question. Is it on focusing on nominal, um, would you, would it be your target? And if so, is it the proper role of monetary policy to offset perhaps misguided uh, non-monetary policies? Right, that's a good question. So one way of using nominal GDP is to break it down using the equation of exchange into velocity and the money stock. But another more obvious way of breaking nominal GDP growth down is into the sum of real GDP growth and inflation. And here's where I both agree, but in the end somewhat disagree with what you just said, Mickey. It's certainly true that 3.8% nominal GDP growth during the period of stubbornly slow recovery reflected in part a decline in real GDP growth. And I agree, a lot of that seems to have to do with um, supply side factors or uh, ish factors unrelated to the Fed's conduct of monetary policy. And yet, we also had a persistent undershoot in inflation as well. And so again, if, if you look at the numbers, the, the numbers are actually there in the paper. Panel A of figure one shows nominal GDP growth and then real GDP growth and inflation. And that 1.5% shortfall breaks down into roughly equal pieces, 3.75% uh, lower real growth, 0.75% lower inflation. So again, I come back to the idea, if inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, can you really look at an undershoot of target of 2% inflation that is that persistent and not get around the idea that monetary policy was insufficiently accommodative. Just to wrap it up, I think regarding QE2, QE3, part of the problem there is that quantitative easing as envisioned and is implemented by the Fed Reserve. And this is quite clear from looking at 
Chair Bernanke's descriptions of what he thought the Fed was trying to do with quantitative easing. It never really was conceived of as a monetary policy action designed to prevent the rate of money growth from falling or designed to stimulate the rate of broad money growth in order to prevent inflation from falling further. Instead, it was conceived of as a series of credit market interventions to help the housing sector, to help the real economy more generally. Now, we can debate about whether it worked or not, but that's sort of beside the point. My point would be it wasn't really monetary policy. It was a credit market intervention. And next time around, I think it, it would be more effective to focus so-called unconventional policy strategies at the zero lower bound on some sort of um, if it's a money growth target, if it's a nominal GDP target, if it's a price level target, a focus on nominal variables to keep the public's focus on <coughs> what the Fed is doing with monetary policy as opposed to credit policy. Thanks. Well, to echo some of the things that Mickey said at the beginning, um, I think the uh, FOMC is close to a, to a turning point. It's raising the policy its policy rate at a measured pace and to normalize monetary policy. And at present, the U.S. economy is in excellent shape with, with low unemployment and inflation close to its target. And as long as these conditions continue, it, the FOMC will continue its, its gradual tightening cycle. However, if inflation increases much beyond 2% uh, per year, the, the FOMC is likely to tighten more leading to the possibility of triggering a, triggering a recession. And even if that does not happen, other shocks, including fiscal tightening as the Trump tax cuts end, and a US tariff-induced unraveling of global supply chains and a slowdown in East Asian aggregate demand could lead to a, to a downturn. But this would be nothing new. The Fed has mistimed its exit strategy and business cycle recoveries in every episode, with the exception of four since 1920. I, I showed this in a paper I think I talked about here like five years ago. So how and when the Fed will react when the situation becomes tricky may be related to both the composition of the FOMC between governors and presidents and the policy preferences of its members, whether they are hawks doves or swingers, and I'll define those terms in a couple of minutes. Now, normally, the FOMC should have 12 voting members, seven governors appointed uh, by the president, and five reserve bank presidents, and of, of whom New York is, is always president, and the other four are on a rotating basis. And they are, the, the, the presidents are appointed by their, their boards of directors. So at present, there are four serving governors with three waiting to be confirmed uh, by the Senate. So there's a general belief that uh, the president will pick governors who have views close to his own, that Republican presidents will pick hawks and Democratic presidents will pick doves. Whereas uh, in the case of reserve bank presidents, they're chosen by their boards of directors. They're less influenced by national politics and their policy preferences often reflect those associated historically with the district. So for example, St. Louis was always monetarist, Cleveland was anti-inflation, as was Richmond. And so their, their presidents have generally been classified as hawks, whereas places like Boston, Kansas City, have often been viewed as Keynesian-oriented and they're dovish. Okay, so that's one thing. In, in addition, there are other important factors may have been viewed um, as determining uh, FOMC members' policy preferences, including, and I'll, I'll elaborate on this in a, in a couple of minutes, when they were born, for example, they were born before or after the Great Depression or before and after the Great Inflation, and the university where many of them received their PhDs. Freshwater schools like University of Chicago or saltwater schools like Berkeley. And these attributes may be crucial in determining, in, in affecting FOMC members' uh, policy choices and whether we may have, have um, a hard or a soft landing. So what, what I did in a recent paper with a, 
a colleague at the Banque de France, Claudiane Estreffi, um, is we, we looked at the policy preferences of FOMC members who served from the early 1960s until 2015, and, and did that in relation to the ideology of those people who appointed them. So we looked at both uh, board governor, governors relative to the party of the US president uh, that nominated, and the regional Federal Reserve Bank presidents relative to the boards of directors of the regional Fed that appointed them. And we, we looked at three types of, of policymakers. So uh, hawks, inflation fighting hawks, growth promoting doves, and then the swingers, uh, my colleague came up with that idea. <laughs> she's, she's, she's European. That is, those, those, those members perceived as, as swinging between the two camps, okay? And that measure, there, there's an index that my colleague put together, and she did this based, it was a very, a very detailed uh, process. She did it by, and this was her thesis, she did this by looking at narrative records in US newspapers and a lot of other sources that are described in the paper regarding the policy leanings of these FOMC members with respect to the Fed's dual mandate. Okay, so there's a figure in the paper that just shows you that index. It shows you that there's been these shifts in the composition, figure one, over time. And that reflects both the rotation scheme of the FOMC, the turnover of members, and swings in preferences. Okay, so that's a figure you could look at. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is ideology by appointment. So there's a theory out there that's been around for a long time called the partisan theory of monetary policy. It's connected with political science. And it suggests that democratic administrations will prefer easy monetary policies and will choose doves, whereas Republican administrations prefer tight money and they'll choose hawks. And in a, sense, in a sense, what our analysis shows, and this is again like 50 years, is that Democratic board members have been mostly perceived to be doves in their, in their tenure at the FOMC, and very few have been perceived as, as hawks. And this is in figure two. The share of hawks does appear higher for Republican nominees, but there's also a number of them that are actually doves. And this isn't surprising if you know, uh, if you know the history of the Fed. So if, if a re-election motive is important, and even Republicans might choose members that have dovish preferences and expectations of policies to support growth and employment. So Nixon is the example we always think of. Um, and the second thing is that the, the president appoints the board members, but each of them has to be confirmed by the Senate. And nominees have a higher chance of confirmation if they're likable by both sides in the Senate. And what our data shows is that 70% of the Board of Governors were confirmed in a Democratic majority uh, Senate. So, so this is the, in the case of, the, of those that are appointed by the President of the United States. When you, whereas when you look at, at Reserve Bank presidents, who are appointed by their local uh, boards with directors, you see a, a high share of hawks regardless of the president's party. And that's in figure two. Uh, and that Federal Reserve presidents seem to be picked rather for having beliefs that go in line with those of the regional Federal Reserve Bank that they happen to represent. And so this, this is especially true for Federal Reserve Banks that have a long tradition of institutional ideology. So I think of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, uh, which is, has been outspoken and anti-inflation, St. Louis, and a couple other places, Richmond, okay. And, um, and on the other hand, uh, you, know, have these, you have these, uh, these reserve banks which tend to have this ideology that's sort of more pro-growth Keynesian, et cetera. Okay, like Boston, Fe Philadelphia, and Federal Reserve. So the, their presidents are pr predominantly viewed as, as doves. Okay, and now, uh, in addition to that, in this institutional uh, memory and ideology, there are a number of other factors that could explain the distribution of types. Okay, like the ties that the Federal Reserve Reserve Banks have with the Board of Governors. And that's been getting, in a sense, the board's becoming more influential in the appointment of presidents in recent years. So that changes things. 
Okay, how strong the ties of the reserve banks are with the commercial banks of the region, and also whether the region itself is conservative or liberal. So these things also matter. So the last thing we do in the paper is we have this, the, 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 we look at, at factors that could mold the type of uh, the central banker's type as a hawk or a dove. And we look at two things. We look at their education and events that shaped their lives before joining the FOMC. What was the key factors in the first thir their first 30 years? Okay, and so when we, we talk about ideology, we mean the graduate schools that they went to, whether they went to Freshwater, University of Chicago, and places associated with it, like UCLA, Rochester. Okay, or, or whether they were, um, you know, went to, to, to saltwater schools, like, you know, MIT, Yale, and Berkeley associated with, with Keynesians, with Paul Samuelson, Bob Solo, and, and Jim Togan. And what, we, what our results show is that uh, about four, uh, more than 70% of members from freshwater schools have been hawks, whereas the majority of members from saltwater schools tend to be dubs. We also found that if you, this is looking at PhDs. If you look at members who are not PhDs, they're lawyers, they're, they're lawyers, they're businessmen, et cetera, okay, guys with bachelors, masters, MBAs, they tend to be less polarized. But, but most of them do seem to be perceived as, as hawks. Okay, the second thing we looked at was the events that are important in people's lives. And what we did was we looked at these major events in the last, you know, going, actually going through the, the, the 20th century. High inflation and high unemployment are the two big things we look at. And so we, we look at, at, at events like, you know, going all the way back, because we, we have a panel of people that were serving since 1960. So some of these guys were born at the turn of the, of the, of the 20th century. So we looked at the you know, World War I inflation, World War II, the Great Inflation, sorry, the Great Depression, and the 1930s. And, um, and what we found is that people do form their co core beliefs early in life, uh, and, that, uh, and they don't change them that much. So we see that people who were born during the Great Depression tend to be doves or swingers, okay? And many of you remember your grandparents or your parents talking about the Great Depression and how that influenced their lives. Uh, those that lived in periods of high inflation, like World War I, World War II, they tended to be hawks, okay? And so what we found in the simplest terms, that the takeaway from this is the odds of being a hawk are higher when a member is born during a period of high inflation or graduated from a university linked to the University of Chicago. A dove's most likely born during a period of high unemployment like the Great Depression and graduated from a strong Keynesian school and had these strong Keynesian beliefs like one like MIT, Harvard, Berkeley, okay. Okay, so let me just conclude with some implications for, for current and future policy. So the fact that you got this divided views uh, in the board versus the regional feds could be uh, important when the FOMC is short of three board members. So it, it could make, it in a sense makes the five regional fed presidents the, uh, uh, the voting majority, which is a pretty rare uh, occurrence. So there's a book, this book by Peter Conti Brown talks a lot about that. Um, <clears throat> so historically, the Reserve Bank presidents have been more independent and outspoken than the members of the board who have been more supportive of the chairman. Mm -hmm. So the last time a board member dissented on policy was in 2005 in one of the last meetings of Alan Greenspan. And since then, Reserve Bank presidents have dissented 57 times and most of them for tighter policy. And so the conclusion that comes out of this is that, that Chairman Powell, he might face a harder job in forming consensus with a, a, a Reserve Bank president's led majority. And if you have a situation with a weak board and a weak FOMC, that can make it challenging to manage further rate hikes in an environment of the intermination of fiscal stimulus and trade policy uncertainty. And so it, it could be trouble ahead if conditions deteriorate and a recession looms. Okay, another point is that it's been 35 years since the end of the Great Inflation. And for some of the new members, 
the great inflation is really a distant memory. But, and the, the seminal event for them is, it, it, in their form, is the great moderation. Okay, so that's, a, again, different from what the sample shows. And, and another factor is that the macroeconomic model that's taught in US graduate schools has converged around the new Keynesian model, which, is, which in a sense combines both freshwater and saltwater. So it makes it a little fuzzy. It's not as black and white as it, as it was when I was a graduate student at Chicago. Um, and also, that ideological factors might have become more muted with time because the Fed, as is the case with many central banks around the world, has converged to an understanding of the importance of price stability and the use of flexible inflation targeting. And also, since the great, you know, since the, uh, since the, the great financial crisis, the debate shifted away from, uh, from inflation and unemployment towards financial stability. And, and, and that's been, until very recently, the growing concern of central banks. And so it, it, it's unclear where the hawk dove, how the hawk dove distinction lines up on that, because the debate really is about, should you be heading off asset price booms? Uh, in advance, or should you be, um, you know, should you be cleaning the mess up later? So this is like a different, a different story. And and finally, the the pendulum has been has been swinging away from the appointment of PhD economists as presidents of regional Federal Reserve banks towards those with an MBA background with an emphasis on pragmatism and short run fixing. So all of these these different forces suggest that. You know that the the hawk dove distinction is is important, but it might not be quite as relevant as it was in the past, and it, it really sort of tells us you have to you have to think carefully about how these you know this this common breakdown will handle the next major next next major inflation inflection point in policy making, which is coming up in the not that distant future. So thank you. Yeah. Questions for Mike? Yes. Yeah. Just one minute. Wait for the microphone. Hi. Very interesting uh, talk. Uh, I wonder if uh, neither of you mentioned balance sheet policy, which actually for the financial markets, uh, the, the correlation between the central bank balance sheets and using the Standard & Poor's as a reference for risk assets, it's enormous. It rounds off to 100%, basically. And we're just reaching the point now where the central banks are taking more out of the financial markets and they're putting in. So is there any hawked of uh, polarity regarding balance sheet policy? Um, it's, it's, it's tricky, OK, because it's not just balance sheet policy. It's forward guidance. It's basically what, and it's this whole question of what do you do when you hit the zero lower bound. So it's not like that. That issue is not strictly a hawk dove uh, idea. It's more about, about, about the, the policy tools that you have. OK, so Milton Friedman, uh, you know, decades ago said, look, if you get in a situation which looks like the zero lower bound, you just print money. You just buy stuff, OK? And QE, in a sense, is that. So I'd say hawks would have thought that was great. And the doves would have thought that was great, too, because you're, you're stimulating the economy. And then the balance sheet increases. Again, that's a consequence of that. And that's a consequence of that, of that policy, which you really needed to do. Okay, but then on the other hand, the hawks will say, well, wait a minute. You know, that policy didn't really lead to that much stimulus, in part because the Fed was, was paying interest on excess reserves and the banks weren't lending. So the, the, what I'm trying to say is it's really hard to take hawk dove and, and and sort of come up with a clear conclusion as to as to what 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 policy should be followed mike at the at the end of your remarks you mentioned the uh, shift toward more business people as opposed to economists at the fed can you comment a little further on what the implications of that might be okay this so this is a you know, I, it, it's a concern of mine. I, I, I mean, I mean, I mean, today our speaker is one of them, and so I didn't want to say anything that would get him upset. But the basic <laughs> point is, so if you're a PhD economist like me or like you know people who are on the board like Charlie, 
So you know, we were we were hawks, but but our view was long run, and you know, we, you think in terms of models and what the models are going to tell you, okay? And models have problems, and you know, the, the, I'm not saying a model based every, work, model based policy is the answer for everything, okay? But if you're a business person, or you have an MBA business person, okay, and you've had all this practical experience, so what you think about is the problems facing you. How you're gonna how you're gonna deal with the problems? You go, a whole list of let's do this 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 this. Okay, it's not the same. PhD economists think differently. Okay, and I'm not saying one's good and one's bad. But when it comes to monetary policy, and this gets back to what was said at the beginning. Okay, that that Mickey and, and Peter, you want to follow rules-based policy. You want to be constrained, and the rules-based policy comes out of models. It comes out of theory comes out of the quantity theory of money, new Keynesian economics. I don't see someone who's uh, at, you know, uh, an MBA type person in the business world thinking like that. And so I see this as tending to give you uh, policy decisions that are more like discretion and fine tuning. Okay, now I may be going out on a limb like this, but this is how I see it, yes. Hi, Guy Hazelman. Uh, this is probably a question for Peter. Uh, all three of you mentioned forward guidance, and and uh, you know I don't think forward guidance certainly, if it works initially, it marginally decreases in effectiveness over time. But if you look at the dot plots and central tendencies, you have a Fed funds that goes up above three percent and then comes back down. How can you possibly have forward guidance in, in a scenario like that? And I, I guess maybe more of a, less of a question, more of a comment. You can comment on, if we go to some rules-based thing like you were talking about, they get rid of forward guidance, they get rid of the dot plots, and it's a nice way to get out. Could you comment on that, Peter? Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, to me, the big advantage of a rule, besides the element of commitment that removes the temptation to do something short term that you'd regret later, lies in communication. Right now, the Chair Powell is talking about additional but gradual interest rate increases. But there are risks on both sides. The economy could continue to accelerate and maybe inflation surprises on the upside and he wants to move more quickly. Or maybe, you know, this has happened before, maybe we're fooled and we go back to something less than 2% real growth and inflation falls back below the 2% target. He's going to reasonably want to adjust expectations for the trajectory of the funds rate. But without a rule, you can't do that without calling into question your reputation either as, you know, this gets back to the distinction between hawks and doves. Does this mean that Chair Powell is not as concerned about inflation as he used to be? Or does it mean that now he's way more hawkish than anyone ever thought? The point is he's neither. The, the policy is a policy strategy, not a commitment to, uh, you know, to a fixed path. And the strategy says that if inflation, if inflationary pressures build, the funds rate has to go higher than we think right now, expect right now. And if the um, and and if inflation comes in lower than expected, they're not going to want to ease policy, uh, tighten policy as quickly. So yeah, I, I think it, it it's hard to communicate contingencies. You know, when when you're speaking to broad audiences, because everybody wants to know exactly what will happen. But I think focusing on a rule will work contingencies into the picture and let them get out of this thing about, like, let's figure out who the, the dots belong to and let's think each time how the dots are changing, what that implies for the Fed's commitment to in inflation fighting. Um, I, I, I see, Charlie, your head's kind of going this way and that way. And I, and I know you had a part in, in developing the dots for the Fed. Would you like to make a comment? Well, I, I, was, I was just going to say, I, I think Peter's exactly right in this interpretation. Another way to put his, the argument he was just making is that 
The mistake the Fed made about forward guidance is it thought it could manipulate forward guidance right. in a way that was kind of an independent tool. And you can't do that because forward guidance implies a commitment to do something and you can't just willy-nilly move it around without stating how you're going to react. So Peter's point about a rule, uh, I used to say a, a rule was the best form of forward guidance because a rule then tells you how the Fed will react to certain things if and when they come along. So that is, for, that is a form of forward guidance because it explicitly states the contingencies under which you, you operate. The Fed used to say, and still does, well, we're data dependent. Well, that's, that's kind of a statement without content. How are you data dependent? What data will you react to and how you re will you react to it? That's what forward guidance would be. And that would be a better form of forward guidance than this game we tried to play about committing to do things. And then when times change, whoops, well, we're not committed to that anymore. Yeah. We're going to do something different. That's, 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 a, that's forward guidance without any content to it. So, um, uh, so it's a fine line. And, but, but Peter's right. Having some sort of systematic rule that articulates some of the contingencies that how you'll react to the data would be a much better way to go about doing it. There's a lot of talk about uh, this morning about not s insufficient monetary policy. Um, I'm not an economist, so I probably can't think that far. So I, I'm more the other side that you don't want to dis dis be disparaged. Uh, um, so the question, the question is, as I recall, uh, we were running out of tools during the dark days. Um, we, are, or, we are ZERP, or, or even if you look at the Europeans, a, a negative. Uh, have, have turned out to be insufficient. You look at the Japanese, insufficient. Um, so I, I'm curious to learn um, what else is there? So I, I, I buy the fact that the expansion of, of uh, balance sheet was, was to save the banks or save the financial institution or to stop us from going into a depression per se. Uh, but okay, so should we triple that? Where, where do we go with it is really what I'm more interested um, because none of us talked about there are other policies beyond monetary policy which is sorely needed but absent. And perhaps those are the ones that really is necessary, both the fiscal and monetary, in order to get us where we need to go. Appreciate your comments. Yeah, so um, going back to the, the great financial crisis, I mean, the, the real concern then was what happens when we hit the zero lower bound, and, and, and that indeed happened. But, you know, it's like Chicken Little. The sky didn't fall. All he did was just, you know, they, just, they, they, they did, you know, open market operations, okay, but just bought different things, which is something that has always been available. And, and it, it didn't work very well, but it, and that's because they did other things too, like they did paid interest on excess reserves, and this forward guidance problem came in, and they were not consistent over time. But it, they, they did get out, we did get out of the great, the great financial crisis, and there's that toolkit they've got. They have, they have QE and they have forward guidance, and there are some people, a lot of people, maybe the establishment says, that's all we need. Okay, others say, wait a minute, those are imperfect tools, and we really want to get back to the, the, the tools that have always worked, which is cutting the funds rate. And that's a reason for normalizing, to give us the ammunition. So we're into that situation right now. And the risk is we don't get high enough, and we have a big recession. So they go back to the other tools. So I don't see this as a big deal. However, one thing I want to say, just a little segue, tangent. So I've done this work. I talked about my, at the last meeting about central bank digital currency. So if, you, if you, we did, which we won't do, but which Sweden will do, and we, we in a sense get rid of cash, and we have you know, this digital currency, and you pay interest on digital currency, then you could use that interest rate on the digital cash to cut the rate to whatever you need to always maintain price stability. Okay, you could follow, as I talked about last time I was here, about a Taylor rule dedicated to price level targeting. 
Okay, so it's like, it's, it's, we're not in this impossible situation where the sky is going to fall chicken little. Okay, they, they, we have tools. We don't have to invent new ones. It's just a matter of using them consistently. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to make a comment, even though I'm the moderator. And, and a, a quantitative easing isn't just, if we look back through recent history, it isn't plain vanilla. Um, Bernanke, um, when he did institute QE1, he specifically said, this is credit policy. We're buying MBS. It's credit policy with the objective of addressing the real weak link, the mortgage market amid a crisis. Fast forward to 2012, um, QE3 had a different purpose. It was quantitative easing. It was just buying a ton of treasuries and mortgages with the ex stated purpose of lowering the unemployment rate. So it's not all this QE. You have to distinguish between what happened during the crisis and w w the, the, its character versus what happened once the economy was was growing and the Fed just didn't like the pace of growth and where the unemployment rate was. Uh, Michael, one of the reasons I really love your paper is because one of my co-authors is a medical doctor and did something similar looking at medical doctors and how they practice in hospitals based upon their schools of origin. So fascinating piece of work. And then you took us through different ways that you could slice and dice this, and you and I on the side shared some of your upcoming research. I'm wondering, given all the data analytics that are going on out there, right? I mean, the way we slice and dice how your Amazon package gets delivered, or you shop online, or how the Manhattan Institute promotes this program, tons of model building going on. How much of that other world of model building may be behind some of these other business people that are coming in, like our luncheon speaker? And, and how do you see that world of model building interplaying with this? Because the world is blending. It's getting different. So you, you teed this up several times, and I'm wondering if you could you know, share with us a little bit more about what's behind the curtain in your thinking. I mean, actually, uh, I think what you're, you're, you're touching on is, re is really exciting. Yes. Uh, and so we, I think economists have tend to think in terms of a model that we've had for, for cent not a, almost a century, going back to Jevons and Marshall. So, and it's you know, this maximizing model based on a certain kind of you know, calculus. So yes, indeed. So there are, there are things that can be learned from physics and other sciences which might have influenced how we, how we do things going forward. And as you mentioned, I've got a project going with a couple of, of colleagues in France. So I get trips to cool places when I do these. Anyways, and, and uh, it's using, he's using physics. And one of my colleagues is an econophysicist. I didn't even know what they were until I met him. Okay, and that gives you a whole different perspective on how you analyze networks, and you know, and I'm looking at what I'm looking at is globalization, financial globalization, and how that's changed over time. But so the answer is, uh, we, yes, people who are not necessarily PhD can bring some new ideas to the table. And when I said what I said, I was thinking in a very maybe backward looking, but when I think of, you know, business, I think of people who, who are really dealing with problems, you know, dealing with situations, and having more of a short-term, a, a more of a short-term focus. Okay, maybe that's not the case anymore. Thank you. I was wondering if you, if you could comment on the following observation. In academia, you build a career by being dogmatic. In the business world, if you are dogmatic, you get fired. So when you do make the transition from the, from ac the academic world to the business world, you learn how to synthesize. So maybe you can comment on the transition, and those who make the transition may be, are, may be called swingers, if you will. OK, well, um, I, I, uh, that, that's a very good point, and it's true. Yes, uh, we, uh, our success depends upon uh, 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 being pretty dogmatic and following something that we've learned how to do and doing it well. And we specialize. In, and the, one of the problems, I think, that's been happening in in economics and in other fields is specialization, which means that people get so much into their little thing that they do that they can't talk to others. I have, I have a colleague that we hired, okay, and this guy, everyone said he's fantastic, he's brilliant, he does a certain kind of econometrics. And so 
And so they hired him, they gave him, like they promoted him immediately. And there was this committee meeting to decide, you know, to read the letters that we got on this guy. And there was nobody in our department. None of the econometricians even understood what the letter writers wrote. Okay, <laughs> but I'm just backing you up. Okay, so yes. So yes, you have to, and you're dealing with the real world of policy, you have to be pragmatic, and those people that can adjust will do well. Swi and Swingers is to, a certain, is, a certain ex is to a certain extent picking that up. That uh, uh, your model of thinking could not work so well when the environment changes. So yes, that's, that, that, is, that is part of a, uh, uh, that could be picking up part of the, the, the learning process of somebody who's an academic learning to be a, a business, learning to be a policymaker. Thanks. Okay, with with that, um, I want to quickly switch over to panel two, um, and after panel two, there will be more time to casually discuss these. and And I'm wondering if Michael is is moving from being <coughs> a, a freshwater economist to being a swinger. <laughs> <laughs>